surface anatomy of the nervous system. The spinal cord. The spinal cord is a continuation of the brainstem as it emerges from the foramen magnum of the occipital bone. It continues through the cervical and thoracic regions and ends at the level of the first lumbar vertebra as the conus medullaris. Within the spinal canal, from L1 down to the end of the sacrum, the spinal canal houses the coda equina. The femoral nerve. The femoral nerve starts from L2, L3 and L4 nerve roots. It descends within the fibers of the psoas major muscle, then between the iliacus muscle to emerge under the inguinal ligament with the other structures of the neurovascular bundle. It principally supplies the quadriceps femoris muscles. The lateral cutaneous nerve of the thigh. It arises from L2 and L3. It emerges from the lateral border of the psoas major. It then passes the lateral part of the inguinal ligament and over the sartorius muscle to supply the lateral part of the thigh with cutaneous sensation. The obturator nerve. Like the femoral nerve, it arises from L2, L3 and L4. It descends the medial aspect of the psoas muscle and emerges near the brim of the pelvis, then through the upper part of the obturator foramen. Here it enters the thigh through the obturator foramen. It supplies the attacto muscles of the thigh and the overlying skin. The sciatic nerve. This is the largest part of the lumbosacral plexus and it emerges from L4 through to S3. It travels deep to the glutei and into the hamstrings. It supplies the posterior muscles of the thigh. Before the knee, it divides into the tibial nerve, which travels directly inferiorly, and the common peroneal nerve, which veers laterally and around the neck of the fibula. The tibial nerve. From above the popliteal fossa, it descends towards the ankle, supplying the calf muscles before it passes posterior to the medial malleolus to supply structures of the foot. The common peroneal nerve, also referred to as the common fibular nerve, it travels around the head of the fibula and then divides into a superficial and a deep branch. Amongst others, it innervates the peroneus longus, peroneus brevis, and the extensor muscles of the foot. Before dealing with the upper limb, let us first define the anterior and posterior triangles of the neck. The anterior triangle has a broad superior border and a narrow apex inferiorly. The borders are anteriorly the trachea, superiorly the digastric muscle or a line extending from the mental protuberance to the mastoid process, and as the posterior border, the oblique sternocleidomastoid muscle. Conversely, the posterior triangle has a broad base inferiorly and a narrow apex superiorly. The borders are anteriorly the sternocleidomastoid muscle. The inferior border is the middle one-third of the clavicle and posterior border, the anterior fibers of the trapezius muscle. The brachial plexus. It originates from C5 to T1. The trunks can be palpated in the posterior triangle of the neck. However, the lower parts of the plexus are concealed by the subclavian artery. The divisions of the brachial plexus are found posterior to the clavicle and are not palpable. The best area to palpate the brachial plexus is in the supraclavicular fossa at the medial end of the clavicle. Care must be exercised as these cord-like structures can be sensitive. In the upper arm, the nerves are difficult to palpate as they are lying deep within the muscles. 
the musculocutaneous nerve. This is not palpable, but its surface anatomy runs from the anterolateral part of the scapula, just medial to the choragoid process, then the anterior borders of the axilla, and over the anteromedial part of the arm, and then the lateral aspect of the forearm. It is made up of a terminal branch of the lateral cord of the brachial plexus. It contains fibers from C5, C6 and C7 segments. It pierces the coracobrachialis, continuing downwards and laterally between the biceps and brachialis muscles. At the elbow, it pierces the deep fascia to continue as the lateral cutaneous nerve of the forearm, the median nerve. In the arm, it descends initially just lateral to the brachial artery, and halfway down, the median nerve crosses the artery to be just medial to it between the biceps brachii and brachialis. Inside the cubital fossa, the median nerve passes medial to the brachial artery in front of the point of insertion of the brachialis muscle and deep to the biceps. After the cubital fossa, it passes between the two heads of the pronator teres. It then travels between the flexor digitorum superficialis and flexor digitorum profundus before emerging between the flexor digitorum superficialis and flexor carpi radialis. At the wrist, it passes under the flexor retinaculum, the radial nerve. It originates from the posterior cord of the brachial plexus. It travels through the axilla, winding posteriorly to the humerus between the medial and lateral heads of the triceps. This is just below the neck of the humerus. At the distal part of the arm, from its lateral position, it comes anteriorly to cross the medial aspect, just anterior to the lateral epicondyle. It then divides into a deep branch and superficial branch. Just below the anterior aspect of the elbow, it divides. The deep branch becomes the posterior interosseous nerve, passing posteriorly to descend to the wrist. A smaller, mainly sensory branch descends anteriorly within the forearm under the brachioradialis muscle. It is not easy to palpate the radial nerve. The ulnar nerve. This is the lowest significant nerve of the brachial plexus. It is therefore the closest to the first rib as it travels over it and into the axilla along the anterior axillary line, then medially in the arm. At the elbow, it lies in a groove just posterior to the medial epicondyle of the humerus. At the medial epicondyle, the ulnar nerve is exposed and can be palpated with ease. It travels in the forearm, again medially, mostly within the flexor carpi ulnaris. The superficial branches may be palpated over the hook of the hamate and just distal to the pisiform. The dermatomes of the neck and upper limbs. The most clinically significant dermatomes are those of the upper and lower limbs. Remember that the boundaries of each dermatomes overlap or diffuse into the boundaries of the adjacent dermatome. In addition, in some individuals, the dermatomes vary from their standard location. Let us begin from the superior aspect of the shoulder. C4, the superior aspect of the shoulder. C5, the lateral aspect of the arm. C6, the lateral aspect of the forearm and down to the lateral two fingers. C7 is the third and fourth fingers. C8 is the fifth finger, the medial aspect of the wrist and medial distal part of the forearm. T1 is medially just below the elbow and until the axilla and T2 is in the axilla. Dermatomes of the body trunk. Note that the body trunk anteriorly, the area above the manubrium, is C3 and immediately below that is T1. 
Then, in successive horizontal arrangements, the dermatomes progresses down to T10 at the umbilicus. T12 is at the suprapubic region. The inguinal regions signify the start of the lumbar dermatomes with L1. Dermatomes of the lower limbs. L2 is the anterior, superior and mostly lateral aspects of the thigh. L3 is the anterior knee area as well as the inferior aspect of the thigh and superior aspect of the lower leg. L4 is the medial aspect of the lower leg until the medial aspect of the foot. L5 is the anterior and lateral aspect of the lower leg, which stretches down to the dorsum of the foot and the medial three toes. S1 is the lateral aspect of the foot and the plantar aspect until the Achilles tendon region. S2 continues to cover the skin over the calf muscles and up to the superior part of the back of the thigh. S3 is the area around the creases of the gluteae. This dermatome is distributed in a concentric like shape around the anus and within these are the S4 and S5 dermatomes in a similar pattern.